you're narrow-minded. You just got lucky and happened to believe the right thing. But if you hold your belief in a rational way and are willing to listen to others and dialogue human to human, you're an open-minded person, even though what you believe and conclude is, like everyone else's belief, narrow. I know that believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is a narrow belief. I'm ruling out Muhammad and, 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 and Lao Tzu and Buddha and all the rest. I appreciate the writings for sure, but I don't think that they're the Savior of the world. I have a narrow belief. But I can tell you why I believe that. And I'm willing to listen to objections. I spent a good part of my life doing that, in fact. And if you want to know why I believe it, you might want to check out the book, Jesus, Lord, or Legend. Uh, there's my advertisement for the day. Uh, but, but I'm willing to talk about it. See, I think I'm open-minded, even though my belief, like your beliefs, are narrow. What makes you broad-minded or narrow-minded is not what you believe, because that's always going to be narrow, but why you believe it and how you believe it. And according to the New Testament, which I have every reason to believe, Jesus is not just one of the many wise people in history, not a spiritual guru, not merely a prophet, not an archangel sent down from heaven, not one of the ascended masters or anything of the sort. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Wise people don't go around saying that. He says, if you see me, you see the Father. Wise people don't go around saying that. He says, I've come from the Father, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Believe on me, you shall be saved. Wise people don't go around saying that. Jesus does. Why? Because he's telling the truth. He is God's presence here on earth, God's forgiveness here on earth. So Jesus, I argue, is the narrow door. There are not many ways. There's only one way. Now, having said that, point number two. Jesus is also called the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. Jesus, the man, incarnated that light. But the light of God shines wherever people are willing to receive the light. In fact, John the Baptist said, when he was introducing Jesus into the world in verse 9, it says, the true light that gives light to everyone, he's referring to Jesus Christ here, was coming into the world. The light that gives light to everyone. Whatever light people have, wherever darkness is being dispelled, wherever people are getting any kind of inkling about who God really is and who they really are and what God's up to in history, however they're getting it, that is Jesus Christ. The light is, being, is shining all over the place. He's the Word of God that speaks all over the place. Insofar as anyone has any light, that is Jesus Christ. The same Jesus who said, no one goes to the Father except through me. Now point number three, we need to lock it in that God wants all to be saved. The passage that I quoted a little bit ago, 2 Peter chapter 3 says, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, to turn from the self-centered way of living to a God-centered way of living. God's dream is for every human being ever born throughout history to be part of that great feast that will go on forever and ever and ever. That's God's dream. Never has there been born a human being who wasn't part of that dream. God is a God of perfect love and therefore has a perfect love for every single being that he creates. God's hope and dream is for them to be in the kingdom. That's why they were born. Paul one time was having a discussion, and he talks about how God, how, how God divided up the nations and, and, and you know, set their times and durations and their spans and things of that sort. And then he says this. God did this, namely working through the nations, so that they, all the peoples of the world, would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Kings and military leaders fight, and they determine the times and the seasons and the durations of kingdoms, yes. But God is involved in all of that. Yes, even the messiness of wars and the establishing of the nations. But God's goal is very different from the goal of the kings and the military soldiers. God's goal is to, to structure things so that people will develop a hunger for him and reach out to him and perhaps insofar as their culture will allow them, even find him. At all times, in all places, in all situations, through all events, God is at work. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And he's working to soften people's hearts, to receive whatever light they have, to turn from their own way of living, and as much as possible to turn to a God-centered way of living, to surrender to him. At all times, he's working to receive, uh, to, to, to get people to receive him and enter into the kingdom. God's dream is for every person to be part of that kingdom. Some of the passages 
in the Bible that talk about God's dream of having everybody in are so beautiful, they're actually troubling to most of our theologies. For example, 1 Corinthians 15 says, For as in Adam all die, listen to this, so in Christ all will be made alive. That's, that's an interesting passage, and there's a number of passages that are like this. Now, I have to remember, we always got to read Scripture in balance, you have all these strong warnings about Gehenna, about hell, about judgment, about being lost. Okay? At the same time, this passage is strongly expressing God's heart and God's dream for humanity. Just as Adam's rebellion kind of encompassed all of us, and we're all dead in Adam, and we're all enveloped in Adam, so also... In Christ, God's love encompasses all of us. God's grace encompasses all of us. As all were in Adam, so all are in Christ. Now, people can still refuse that. They, they have their free will and can resist that. But from God's end, from God's vision, with God's heart, his, he's got a bear hug around everybody. He's, he's looking at all of humanity that's ever existed, and he's saying, mine, mine, in Christ you are mine. That's God's heart. He's not willing that any should perish. And that vision, that magnificent vision of this all-inclusive love, you find throughout the Bible. We often miss it because it doesn't square with our theology. We wear different lenses as we read the Scripture. But there's some breathtakingly beautiful inclusivity in, in, in the Bible. When God calls Abraham to start his Israel project, he says, through you all the nations and all the families of the world will be blessed. He wanted to use Israel to reach everybody. And you find that throughout the Bible. He, he's always saying, there's coming a day when all the nations will gather around Zion and worship me and, and will lay down their arms and, and, and be at peace and be reconciled to me. Some of the most beautiful passages of Scripture are when God, is when God does this, pronounces this vision, right in the midst of judging nations. We often miss this, but very frequently when God is lowering the boom on the nasty, wicked nations in the Old Testament... Even in the middle of that, he'll utter a word of mercy and kindness and hope. It's just beautiful the way he does it. I'll give you one example. One of the, Israel's worst enemies was Assyria. They were barbaric as all get out. Another enemy was Egypt. In the middle of a time when Assyria is attacking Israel, and so you can understand why all the Jews would hate the Assyrians and want the Assyrians to go to hell. In the middle of that, the Lord says this in Isaiah 19. The, the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. And here's where all the suffering Israelites want to go, yay! Ah, but he will strike them and heal them. In fact, the passage has the connotation of he'll strike them in order to heal them. For a God of love expressed on Calvary, striking is never the last word. It's never an end in and of itself. He strikes in order to heal. His heart is always for healing. They, the Egyptians, will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt, and the Egyptians will go to Assyria, no longer to make war, but because they consider themselves neighbors. In fact, he says the Assyrians will go to Egypt, and the Egyptians to Assyria. The, the e Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing to the earth. These are the nasty, nasty enemies of God and enemies of Israel, but here God is pronouncing this beautiful bear hug vision of e uh, around Egypt and Assyria. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my artwork, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. What a beautiful, magnificent vision. This is the dream of God. Far from being stingy and, and scanty and a few, it's all encompassing. He's giving a bear hug around everyone, even those who are the worst enemies. And what a hope it should give us. Because the promise is really saying there's coming a day, folks, when there's coming a day when, when, when America and Iran are going to sit down together and they're going to they're, they're going to have a feast together and they're going to party together and they're going to love God together. And there's coming a time, praise God, when Israel and Palestine they're going to sit down together, they're going to dance together, they're going to love God together. And the Bosnian and the Serbs. And Russia and Georgia and all the conflict will cease and the world will be as God wanted the world to be. And there's this bear hug around all the nations. The former enemies of God are going to be friends of God and friends of one another. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful, breathtaking vision. Not a little one. It's a wide vision. All-encompassing vision. Which then leads to the fourth consideration. As we're thinking about this issue, 
Many in the Bible, we've got to take this seriously, many in the Bible end up in the kingdom who don't consciously know Jesus. Jesus. 